Tonight, Andy Brown will be giving us a presentation on barn owls in Maryland. Andy is retired from Calvert County Natural Resources Division, where he worked for 34 years as a naturalist. He has a BS in wildlife management from Fosterburg State University and an MS in public administration from Central Michigan University. Andy grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland, where he began birding as a teenager with Prince George's Audubon and received his bird banding license at age 16. Andy began working with barn owls in the Patuxent River Valley in the early 1990s. He currently serves on the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership Farmland Raptor Committee as the Barn Owl Coordinator and is on the Board of Directors for the Eastern Bird Banding Association. He currently resides in Frederick County, Maryland. Uh, so thank you, Andy, and we're looking forward to your talk. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, very good. Well, first off, before we get started with the slides, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I, I know a number of you are first timers in, um, for in-person lectures um, and gatherings uh, since uh, since COVID began. And I really appreciate uh, being able to be here and, and talk with you tonight. So thank you. Hmm. Oh, it just happened, Andy. So as Kristen was mentioning, um, I started my, my barn owl work in the Patuxent River Valley back in the early 1990s. Um, so a lot of the information that I have for you tonight is based on um, my experience and my work in, in the Patuxent River, um, and we'll go through some of the some of the natural history and the ecology of these birds. Um, but you're going to soon see that there's a, a whole lot that we really don't know about barn owls, at least here in in, uh, in North America. So um, we have a whole lot to learn, and it's uh, it's it's kind of exciting uh, getting started uh, uh, in a, you know, studying these animals um, that that there's very little little known of, uh, about. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about barn owls in Maryland, their ecology and their conservation. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit about the evolution and taxonomy, ecology, history of conservation efforts current and future conservation efforts, and the Maryland Bird Conservation Farmland Raptor Program. So mo anybody who has seen a barn owl is probably about the uh, extent of the view that you have gotten. A, a fuzzy figure up high in the rafters of, a, of an abandoned barn or an old building, um, secretive birds. They are very, very shy, and they do not like to be intruded by humans. Um, too many visits to a roosting barn owl will, will cause that bird to leave, uh, vacate, and, and search for another, another location. Barn owls have been part of human history for, for hundreds of years. Um, they've lived in close proximity with us, um, beginning in, in Europe. Uh, this, this particular uh, structure was uh, created by, by uh, Germans. Um, in Germany. Um, it was built specifically for barn owls to nest in on their house. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, we joke a, a lot about um, frequently is that we're going to have to start changing our nest box design to make sure that it has a, a heart-shaped uh, heart entrance hole for now instead of a circular one. You can imagine what it must have been like in the early colonial times, walking into the barn late at night to feed or tend to the livestock. And, and as you open the door, this is the image that you see coming out of the barn. Um, you can see how over time and throughout history, owls have conjured up lots of uh, uh, images and myths about uh, ghosts and, and spirits and, and the like. Um, especially uh, with a barn owl, their vocalization is very different than uh, than a regular owl or uh, some of our other owls. Up close, these birds are probably one of the most beautiful birds I have ever seen. Um, the coloration, the white underneath, the cinnamon, the buff color, the slate blue, and you notice that the tips of all the feathers have little diamonds on them. They are stunningly beautiful birds. I've had a long running argument with uh, some of uh, my naturalist friends who think that uh, snowy owls are prettier than, uh, than, than barn owls. Um, you know, to me, a snowy owl is black and white, right? I think this guy has gotten beat, so. But, you know, it's a matter of personal taste, I guess. 
There are two families of owls in the world, the Strigidae and the Titonidae. It was long, I, I was long taught that barn owls were the only member of the Titonidae family, that they occupied, they, that family only had barn owls in it, okay? Um, but that is, that's actually incorrect. Um, there are some major differences between the two groups of owls. The strict, the, the strict owls, as you see with the bard on the right, on the left, they're typical owls that you, they're called the typical owls, the strigidae. Um, they have the rounded faces, um, the, and the short round wings for flying and flying through the forest and so forth. They, most of them have some sort of hooting vocalization. So if you want to go ahead and, and click on that. Oh, good. We'll try it. Let's see what we got here. Let's see if it'll. I have to uh, get off the Well, the and laser might lose it. Nah. Most of us are familiar with, here we go. <laughs> So if you just click anywhere in the slide, it'll stop. Oh, go back. Perfect. There are also some physiological differences between barn owls and the other true owls. You notice the shape of the body is a little bit different. They're long and thin. They're taller, less round. The shape of the face is more heart-shaped rather than rounded. They have an elongated skull, which I'll see. You'll see some some photographs that uh, point that out, especially in the young. Their syrinx, which is comparable to our larynx in, in the trachea that produces sound, is shaped differently than, than, the, um, than the true owls. So they do not make a hooting sound. If you want to click on the barn owl, you'll see what they sound like. Oh, I do want to. <laughs> so you can imagine hearing that sound from a white figure coming out of the barn late at night, um, definitely would uh, conjure up some thoughts of ghosts and, and such. So, as I mentioned before, wing shape was one of the interesting things that separate the barn owls from some of the strict owls. Um, uh, the, there's a there's a measurement of, of of a bird's wing called the aspect ratio, and it's the ratio of length versus width of the wing. You can see the barn owl at the top is much longer and thinner than the barred out below it, which is shorter and rounder. This is, a, this is an adaptation that um, allows him to fly freely out in the open country. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as opposed to within the forest and, and maneuvering between trees. Barn owls broke away from the true owls about 45 million years ago. And then about 25 million years ago, started to separate into various species. There are two genera in the Titonidae family, okay? The Titoninae, which includes the barn owl, and the uh, Fodilinae, which includes the bay owls of Indonesia. Very strange looking little birds, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. very strange. Now, among the Titonidae, there are actually four groups the sooty owls, the grass owls, and the mast owls of Australasia, and then the barn owl, which is found globally. It's said to be cosmopolitan. They're found on every continent other than Antarctica. Very good. There are, there are a few other animals that are cosmopolitan, okay? Humans being one of them. And um, so there are some other birds that are also cosmopolitan not just barn owls. Peregrine falcon, osprey, and cattle egret are found on every continent except Antarctica. Very, very few birds. It was believed that barn owls began, started in Southeast Asia, okay, and dispersed along these pathways that you see globally. They're found mostly in open grassland, Areas, meadows, pastures, not areas of row crop, okay? Row crop does not support their food. So a cornfield or a bean field is not where you'll find a barn owl. You'll find them in meadows. You'll find them in pasture land, okay? They employ a very unique hunting strategy. 
They fly low over the grassland back and forth in one direction, left to right. Then they'll change their direction north to south, front to back, in what's called quartering. And they fly back and forth over this field where they listen for their prey. Listen. You notice their eyes are much smaller than the true owl's eyes. It's one of the things I didn't point out in that slide. They have a smaller eye compared to their skull shape, skull size, okay? The reason being is that they hunt almost primarily by sound or by hearing. They have exceptional hearing ability. There have been studies done on captive barn owls where they've been, where blinders have been put on the bird so that they cannot see and still 99.9% .9 of the time, they capture the prey by sound alone. They have some interesting adaptations on their head that help to amplify this, this hearing ability. The feathers on the front, so if you, if you think about, if you think about an owl's face, this is, this is, um, this is characteristic of all owls, the, the Strigidae, the true owls, and the, and the barn owl. They have this facial <laughs> disc, okay? makes their eyes point forward, right? Okay, that's what gives them a human-like appearance. But this facial disc is actually a flap of skin that acts very much like a hand cupping behind your ear. So if you're to hold your hand behind, my, behind your ear, my voice is gonna be amplified. And if you take it away, it's a little bit softened, okay? So that, that facial disc does that in terms of the skin. On the front of the facial disc, oops, on the front of the facial disc are these thin feathers that are that are um, have spaces between the barbs. Okay, they are they are said to be auditorily translucent or transparent. Okay, so it allows sound to pass through them. Oops, you hit the wrong button. Sorry. It allows sound to pass through them, and then on the back of the facial disc are these thick, dense feathers that are auditorily opaque. The sound bounces off of those thick, dense feathers and then is channeled into the ear opening. Ear openings are interesting as well. Owls, most of our owls have what are said to be asymmetric ear openings, one higher on the head and one lower on the head. Okay, there are two types of asymmetrical ear openings among owls. Some are in the skin, others are actually the holes in the skull where the ear canal. Uh, runs. Barn owls have asymmetrical skull ear openings, okay, holes in the skull. What this does, it allows the owl to hear the noise from two different vantage points. So if you think about triangulation, where you measure a distance from one place and measure a distance from another, you can pinpoint where that you can go to that exact location, right, and not be, not be off. That's exactly what these birds do. They get the sound from two different vantage points, therefore can judge the distance and the location exactly where that sound is coming from. I don't know, but I know it's happened to me in numerous times that you could swear that you hear a sound coming from over there. This bird's calling right there, when in actuality, he's on the, he's behind you on the other side. Okay. Is there a threshold for decibels? Threshold for decibels? They can hear 20 times louder than we can, okay, 20 times. So they fly across this grassland, listening, back and forth, low across the pasture, listening for their prey. They hear their prey, they turn that head downward like a great big satellite disc, or, um, uh, I just lost it, the parabolic microphone, okay? Um, and listen, when they pinpoint the location, they plunge into the grass with those great big long legs, long thin legs, and they capture their, their prey. What do they eat? What are they listening for? Meadow voles, okay? Barn owls eat about, if they have the opportunity, will we'll feed on nothing but meadow voles, 100% meadow voles. Now, what is a meadow vole? So let's have a little small mammal uh, 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 instruction. Up in the upper left there, this is a mole, M-O-L-E, right? See the big digging feet? He is an insectivore. He eats insects, grubs, earthworms, etc. He makes those tunnels in your yard, okay? 
In the upper right is the meadow vole, V-O-L-E, okay? He is a rodent, he's gnawing. Many of you have had problems with voles in your garden or your landscape, okay? We have two species of voles in Maryland, meadow vole and the woodland vole. The ones you have problems with in your garden and in your in your in your yards are most likely the woodland vole. Meadow voles are found in grassland and pasture areas. Okay. In the the lower left is a shrew, also an insectivore, very long uh, uh, pointed nose, extremely short tail. This particular one is called uh, the short tailed shrew, probably the most abundant in our area. Um, and then we have the mice. Everybody's familiar with the mice. Okay, the big ears, the big eyes, the long thin tail, the mice and the rats. Okay, so barn owls feed almost entirely on these meadow voles in the meadow. Meadow voles, why? Why do they eat meadow voles? Okay, meadow voles are not subterranean. Somebody said it. <laughs> I'm going to get to it. They, they exist on the surface of the ground. They follow these trails, okay? And most of the grasslands that we have have grass that grow tall and fold over, okay? And create these, these corridors or these pathways that the voles travel. Apparently, voles are pretty noisy from what I've read, okay? They do a lot of vocalizations. They squeak back and forth to each other, making them easy to find by predators. Just about every predator that I'm aware of will eat a meadow bowl. So my theory is they must be pretty tasty as well. <laughs> so. In terms of research, barn owls are the most studied owl species in the world. They've been studied more than anybody else. However, the majority of the research has been done in Europe, as you can see here, followed second by North America. Unfortunately, 80% of the studies in North America are diet-based. They're about what these owls are eating. There's not a whole lot known about their ecology, okay? Where they live, how long they live, their, their home ranges, um, foraging areas, seasonal movements, all of those different things we don't know very much about. We know a lot about Europe, but we don't know much about the other areas in the world. In the Patuxent River Valley, I have an analyzed pellet uh, nest box contents, the pellets that were regurgitated, and look through and see what they're eating, okay? It's been a little bit different in the Patuxent River, okay? In the Patuxent River, they're eating only about 40% meadow voles, whereas elsewhere in agricultural areas would be over 90%, okay? They supplement their diet with a marsh rice rat. So these owls are actually hunting in the marshes. They're flying low over the marshland, and as the as the rice rats climb the climb the, the stems, they they plunge down and grab them. So it's about 50-50 meadow voles and rice rats. They also will prey on some marsh birds, the majority red-winged blackbird that they catch out in the marsh, and then a spattering of other things, shrews, occasionally a house mouse. Sometimes some other marsh birds like soar rails, Virginia rails, et cetera. We did find a bunch of, in one particular nest box, a bunch of immature purple martin skulls. So this owl found a martin house and cleaned it out, unfortunately. So martin lovers, I'm sorry to, to make that announcement, but that that's not common, okay? Barn owls are going to eat rodents whenever they can. So if there's a good rodent population, they're not gonna bother with birds feeding on other birds. If you think about it, these guys give them the best bang for the buck, okay? They're gonna get the most nutrition out of, out of, out of a rodent than they, than they do a bird. This is a, a look at North America, um, a synopsis of the diet uh, studies that were done up in the upper left is um, microtus, which is meadow vole. And you can see just about everywhere in North America, they're feeding on 80% or more of the meadow voles, okay? Over to the, over to the, to the right, uh, the sigma don is, the, um, is the, the, the rat, okay, the marsh rice rat. 
Okay, you can see around the Chesapeake Bay, there's a little darker spot um, where where the uh, rice rats, where they're feeding on rice rats. Um, Paramiscus is the white-footed mouse that we're all familiar with that gets in our house. Mus is house mouse. And then Rethrodonomies is uh, harv eastern harvest mouse. And eastern harvest mouse, mouse is uh, listed as an endangered species in Maryland. So they're, they're really not even them here. This is a fascinating study that was conducted a few years ago, and you may it was published in Audubon magazine. You may remember it. Um, it was called the White Fright, and what they did was they did they did a study on how um, voles responded to a predator's approach. Okay, you if you think about um, a mouse or a, a rabbit, um, most most prey prey animals they will sit still and hope that they're not being seen, okay? Until that predator gets too close and then they fly, okay? So what they did in this study is they measured the length of that, that um, um, this, this, the freeze, the freeze stage, okay? The time that the, that the bull was in that freeze stage before it, before it took flight, okay? They had two taxidermied barn owls, one male who was bright white underneath, and then a, a female from Europe that had was mostly they have a like a red color morph, a darker a, a darker color, and they ran these owls down the zip line and they measured how long those voles froze before they before they exited. On nights of, of bright bright light, we all know that it's rare to have a complete dark sky out there okay but on nights with full moons and, and and bright nights they measured that the voles stayed in that freeze mode twice as long with a white bird versus a dark bird okay so it's kind of like the deer in the headlights effect you know there's bright bright white things coming at you and it's almost blinding you can't really make out what it is right so they stay in that freeze mode for twice as long hence making them easier to capture. Well, that makes you think, well, why aren't they all white, right? Well, there are some nights that are not very bright out. And they noticed that on the nights of dim light, that the red, the darker owls, the, the freeze time, the freeze time was longer with the darker owls on the dark nights. So it's a, so they're, they're, they're getting them double whammy. You know, dark nights, the dark bird gets more. Bright nights, the white bird gets more. Hmm. Studies in uh, studies in Europe showed a hit, this particular one by the Barn Owl Trust in, in Britain showed that a typical barn owl home range was about 400 acres during the nesting season and increased up to about 1,200 acres during the winter months. We don't have any idea what that's like in, in the US. We don't know what their home ranges are. So we wanna to try to duplicate this information to see what we can find. Oh, I'm in Zoom and not on the slide. I can't advance. You can't advance? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me find out why I did that. About now. Yes, perfect, excellent. So this is a this is a nest box we have along the Tuxum River, and I, I you know, did a a one mile radius circle, um, uh, and well a 500 acre radius circle, and then a one mile radius circle. But you can see that a lot of this habitat is woodland. And this is this is area that these barn owls are not hunting in. So really, the the the, the home the home range should be something more elongated. It may even go out into the marshes or even across across the Tuxum River. Studies in Europe have found that these birds typically fly about a mile from their nest site to hunt. That's about the maximum. However, a bird in Sweden on, on you know, routinely every night flew 30 miles to hunt and then bring food back to, back to the nest. So it varies obviously on the, on the abundance of food and where they're finding the food. But this is good information that we would like to learn here in, uh, in, in, in North American birds. So 
Breeding Bird Atlas, as Sue was telling you about, was conducted, the first one was conducted in 1986-87, and the second one in the, in the early 2000s, um, showed a statewide decline of barn owl by 72%. Oh, pretty significant. Now, this may not be 100% accurate. Um, one of my good friends, uh, Scott Smith with uh, uh, Maryland DNR Wildlife and Heritage, spent a great deal of time in 1986 finding barn owl nests throughout the state of Maryland. Okay, he documented, he spent, he spent years, hours and years um, looking for them, okay? That effort was not duplicated in 2006, okay? So it may not be quite as bad as what you see here as 72%. We're gonna try to find that out. That's our task now is to revisit a lot of these historic nesting sites that were found in the first breeding bird atlas and see if they're still active. So that is, that's our goal. That's one of, that, that's one of our goals here in, in the next several years. This is a breakdown of the, um, of the change by region, by state region, okay? One that I am personally aware of is Southern Maryland, okay, and the Patuxent River, okay? That was a 57% decline. That is true, that is accurate. I do know that for a fact. I don't know about all these other areas, but I do know that the Patuxent River did experience a 57% decline, okay? So, even if it wasn't 72%, it was still fairly significant, okay? Better than 50, at least, maybe even more, so. So the history of conservation efforts in Maryland. Um, in 1986, National Audubon put barn owl on the blue list. In 88, Maryland DNR started a marsh nest box program in Dorchester County and a nest box program in Frederick County, okay? Scott Smith that I was telling you about was the one who was responsible for this. Scott Smith and Glenn Thayer published a paper in the late 80s that was titled Barn Owls or Marsh Birds 2. Okay, <laughs> and, it, and it's true. The nest box nest boxes that, that they put up in the eastern shore marshes of Dorchester County were incredibly effective. Okay, almost 100% occupancy. The marshes in Dorchester County are a little bit different than the marshes in western on the western shore of the bay. They have different marsh grasses. Marshes over on, you know, on the eastern shore have lots of meadow voles that live in them, but our marshes do not. Okay, they have marsh rice rat instead. In 89, Prince George's County started an nest box project along the Patuxent River. In 91, Maryland put barn owl on the watch list. 94, we began a nest box program in Calvert County, and in 99, expanded into St. Mary's. 2015, the Maryland State Wildlife Action Plan designated barn owl as a species in critical need of conservation in Maryland. They're hurting and we need to help them. This is a nice shot of the marsh box out there in Dorchester County near uh, Blackwater Refuge. So how do we know where to put up nest boxes? We have a list of criteria. Obviously, if there's owls present, get a box up, right? <laughs> okay, that's no brainer. If it's been a historical nesting site in years past, they have found in Britain that if a nest site is abandoned, if the, if the birds die or if they leave, those are one of the first ones to be recolonized, the ones that were occupied before. So historical sites are, are, are a high priority. Proximity to a historical site, suitable habitat. Prior to colonization, where did these birds found? We had long discussions about, were they really ever a Maryland bird? you know, historically in pre-colonial times? The answer is yes, okay? They did hunt the marsh. They were found in grasslands in the Hagerstown Valley, okay? They nested in tree cavities, holes in cliffs, any kind of cavity they could find. 
in the Midwest, they actually nest in large bales of hay, <laughs> which is kind of cool. I was just out in, in Boise, Idaho, and uh, we were we were working on barn owls there and walked down this 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 path between giant, giant bales, stacks of bales of hay. And you can see the ground was littered with pellets where these birds were roosting in the gaps between the hay bales. Really cool. On the eastern shore and in southern Maryland, they traditionally used duck blinds, offshore duck blinds, as nesting, nesting sites. Got a barn owl nesting inside and an osprey on the top. <laughs> so let's get into a little bit about their ecology, nesting ecology. They're, the males and females are a bit dimorphic. Females are probably about a fourth larger, maybe about 100 grams more than the males. Um, in most cases, females have larger spots on the breast and have more buffy coloration on the chest, whereas males tend to be more white, fewer and smaller black spots. The, um, the, those, those dense opaque feathers that I was talking about behind the facial disc on males are white versus tan on a female. Excuse me. There was a study done in Israel, which was kind of really cool, where they took um, they took a female and they they clipped all of her spots off of her feathers, okay, wow. and then put her back out there and watched what happened. Well, the result was the male stopped bringing as much food. He still brought food, but not didn't bring as much. Okay, traditionally, the male brings about seventy five percent of the food items to the to the clutch or to the brood. Okay, and the female about 20, 25%. So what he was probably experiencing was that, hey, there's another male who's bringing food here. I don't have to work as hard, okay? <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. They spend their non-breeding time apart. They're solitary, okay? They get together um, in order to start courtship and nest. Courtship is... Um, is, is most of the courtship behaviors are, are allopreening, where they preen each other and some, some little chitter-like vocalizations. Um, it happens mostly in the nesting cavity, okay? Um, they copulate multiple times in the nesting cavity. Um, the male will bring food items to her. He has to prove that he can support a family. So he's, he's the one who brings all the food. They start to, uh, they start to regurgitate pellets in the cavity and will pick those pellets apart as they dry. And that creates the substrate for which the eggs are laid, okay? Think about it, a whole pocket full of uh, bowl fur. That's a pretty soft and cushy uh, environment. Um, most of the time, she'll start to molt her flight feathers while she's in the nest cavity, okay? She doesn't have to fly as much, so it's a good opportunity for her to, to grow some new feathers. One egg is laid every two to three days. Okay, so the average clutch is about five to seven eggs, somewhere in that, that range. The female is the sole incubator. Incubation is about 35 days long, which is kind of long compared to other birds. Okay, it's a fairly long incubation, especially uh, an altricial bird that, um, you know, hatches out, you know, blind and naked. Um, usually those are the ones have the shortest incubation period. Um, the theory is, is that Barn owls have difficulty um, you know, building up fat or they don't want to, they do not do it, okay, because they need to stay light and they need to be able to fly and catch food. So if they get real fat, um, they can't fly as fast, <laughs> okay? So their eggs tend to be small and they tend to be, um, have a little, little fat in the yolk. So that's why incubation tends to take a little bit longer than some of the other species. Incubation begins with the laying of the first egg. She'll, she'll start incubating her first egg. A few days later, she'll incubate the second and third and so, and so forth, okay? What that results is asymmetric, results in asymmetric hatching, okay? The first egg hatches before the second and the second before the third and so on and so on. Um, a lot of our larger birds of prey do this behavior, okay? What that means is your older chicks are, are getting fed more, okay, getting fed first, right? Um, that lessens the competition for food in the nest. 
The older, the older chicks are going to get more food. The younger chicks are going to get less food. If they were all the same age, you'd have to feed them all the same amount of food. Okay. So you can get away with giving Charlie over here the lion's share while Becky, on the other hand, can get, can survive with, you know, the, 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 the leftovers. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's, that's not a very attractive animal. There, you know, yeah, you know, only a face and all the female. Exactly. Yeah. So. She will brood the young until they're about three weeks old, until they can start to regulate their own body temperature. Once they're three weeks old, um, three or four weeks old, she's out of there. Okay, she does not spend the night, spend the spend the day with them anymore um, because they pester her to death. You know, <laughs> but, you know, you know how kids are. So anyhow, <clears throat> so if you would think about how long she's in there on those eggs. She lays it, lays one egg, right? She has to incubate that one for 34 days. Well, if she lays a clutch of six or seven, you know, that's another seven days after 34, right? And then another three weeks she's brooding on, brooding the chicks. She's in that, she's in that cavity for a long time. Yeah. Meanwhile, the male is bringing the, all the, the, the lion's share of the food. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Aren't they the cutest thing? I, it looks like, to me, it looks like something out of a 1950s sci-fi movie, okay? But what's interesting about this, you can definitely see the age disparity among these chicks, okay? This is the oldest one, uh, but look at this bird's skull over here. Look how long, long it is. It looks very vulture-like to me, um, which is uh, not, not typical of what the other, you know, what your typical owls are. They, they'll be a little much shorter. But at about five weeks, they start to uh, start to get some facial feathers, and then they're starting to look a little cute, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> the largest clutch ever recorded was 19 eggs. Oh. Okay, 19 eggs. 16 of the 19 survived. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what probably occurred in this situation was one male tending two females, and they probably laid eggs together in the same box. They probably incubated side by side. They probably shared incubation um, responsibilities. And so that said, they ended up raising two families together, uh, blended family, um, which uh, that's a lot of mouths to feed. Um, it's estimated that one nest of barn owls um, will consume about 4,000, between three and 4,000 rodents in a nesting season. Okay. So yeah, yeah that's that's a lot, that's a lot of a lot of holes there. Um, it, so how in the world do all of these birds survive? You may have heard of something called brood reduction. When you have clutches or broods of, of birds, especially the larger raptors, this occurs in the larger raptors a lot, is that if food sources become scarce, then the older birds end up, the so older chicks end up surviving and the younger chicks perish, okay? It was long believed that the, the older chicks, the older, stronger chicks would actually prey upon the younger ones in the brood. They would actually kill them and eat them. Um, we've gotten a lot of good information from nest cams recently, okay? And to my knowledge, I don't know that that has actually been observed. Now, if you're in a clutch, uh, if you have a brood of, 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 of young owls and the food source dries up, the, the smaller, weaker ones will starve to death, right? Because they're not getting as much food. Well, they're fair game then. The uh, older chicks will eat them, okay? But they don't actively kill them and eat them. They eat them after they've perished, okay? Good sound one. Hmm? Yeah, so uh, we'll get to that in a second. They do some really interesting behaviors, however, which is opposite of what we normally thought of. They participate in um, um, they participate in cooperation, where the older birds oftentimes will take a prey item if they're full, and they'll rip it apart and feed the younger younger birds in in, in the brood. Okay, that that had never been observed before without these these nest cams. They also do something that's very fascinating. It's called negotiation. Whereas they will talk to each other, the chicks talk to each other all night long, 
okay? And they negotiate who's going to get the next meal, okay? Charlie over here got the last one, so he's not due for a while, okay? So they talk back and forth, and they, they judge who's the hungriest by how loud the vocalization is and how long the length of the vocalization is. They'll go back and forth and they'll, they'll establish a hierarchy of who's going to get fed next. The one who just got fed will then pull himself back and wait in the back of the group, okay, and let the, the more hungrier ones go up to the front. Fascinating, just absolutely fascinating. So I was trying to trap adults one night <clears throat> and I put the put an MP3 recorder up on top of the box because I wanted to see what kind of vocalizations the adults made when they brought food to the food to the to the chicks. Well, I didn't record any adults. What I did record, however, was this negotiation, which is really cool. This this audio that you hear has one chick that starts out and then another one will kick in. So it'll go and you'll hear them talking back and forth. This is something you can hear from the nest box all the way across the field, sitting out there late at night, waiting for the adult to get trapped. You can hear the hear those chicks talking to each other. So yep, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's true. One thing that they found, and this is very interesting, these birds will fledge at about nine weeks of age. Okay, they come out of the box, they fly, fly around, they go back in the box, they'll, they'll sleep in the box during the day in the, in the cavity. Um, the parents will, will continue to feed them for a couple of weeks. They'll stay with, stay with the parents, okay? Um, so they'll, they'll hang out um, and they'll, they'll beg to be, to be fed. One instance in, um, in Israel where they were using um, what are called pit tags, passive integrated tags. They're the, the kind of uh, uh, chips that you put in your pets, right? Okay. Um, they, they have a, a, a type of a leg band that has this pit tag embedded in the band. Um, and um, so they had a reader next to the nest box and they can, as, as the birds with these pit tags come and go in the nest box, they can identify who they are, okay? Without having to capture them, without having to read band numbers, you know, this, this electronic reader tell, tells, you, tells you who they are. All of a sudden one night, there's a strange pit, there's a strange tag being recorded at this nest box, okay? They go in and look it up and come to find out it is a recently fledged bird from an adjacent nest box. And he's visiting somebody else's house, okay? He's coming every night and he's going in and he's getting dinner, okay? We've probably had that neighbor growing up who always came and knocked on the door and said, hey, what's for dinner tonight, right? <laughs> so that's what he's doing. Um, unfortunately, sometimes he will outcompete the younger chicks that are in that box. Sometimes he'll even kill them, okay? Um, but uh, but that it's something that's called kleptoparasitism. Uh, <laughs> we don't know if that happens here in North America or not, or elsewhere <laughs> in the world. Israel has the highest density of nesting barn owls of any place in, 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 the, in the world. So it could be um, a result of, of just such high density of, of nesting. Um, but there, there's some pretty intense uh, uh, density in, uh, out west too. So it, it would be an interesting study to do, see if it occurs here as well. So when the chicks are about um, five to six, uh, between five and seven weeks old, we ban them. We go up in the in the nest box, pull them out. Um, they get uh, USGS uh, um, um, uh, leg bands. These are called lockover bands for for raptors. They have a little tab that bends over. Um, here we are putting the leg band on. Um, there's dirty little feet. Um, <laughs> so we learn a lot from banding. However, um, their numbers are in such low. The, the numbers are so low that we get very few band returns. Um, so, you know, we have to try to employ some other uh, methods uh, to, to, to get some data on these. Uh, mortality and survivorship in, in Europe has been, and it has been estimated at about, at about 20 to 25% in the first year. So 75 to 80% of the young birds are, are perishing. They're dying. Okay. What kills them? 
a whole host of things. Um, they are prey, prey, they are, do fall prey to other owls. If they're spooked, if they're flushed during the day, you know, hawks, hawks will kill them. Um, probably the greatest cause of mortality in most areas is vehicle strikes, which is, which is very unfortunate. They, they, they hunt these open areas. Um, they'll hunt roadsides that are, you know, are, uh, they're essentially managed meadows. Um, and they, they get, they get hit by cars. Once they, um, once they make it through their first year, they, they tend to be, they tend to live uh, uh, pretty long. I think, um, you know, the maximum wild uh, uh, longevity record is about 15 years. Probably average is, is somewhere in the, yeah, it's, it's hard to say the, the average is four, four years old, four, four or five years old, which is typical of what you might find in a songbird. Your larger raptors obviously live much longer than that. Um, but, you know, that takes into account that high mortality of that, that first year. Once they get past that first year, you know, they could probably live, you know, easily, you know, upwards of, of, of 10 years. We have, we have one nesting male in the Patuxent River that we've caught year after year after year. And he's, he's now nine years old going into his 10th year. So uh, pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> I mentioned the, um, the you know, the uh, um, state uh, wildlife action plan uh, and the um, species of greatest conservation. How many are, many of you might be familiar with the Maryland Bird Conservation uh, Partnership, a nonprofit uh, organization, and they're, you know, they're, they create partnerships that, uh, and help address actions for, for birds in Maryland that are in, in need of conservation. They're doing a lot of work with the chimney swifts. And so we, we started this uh, um, farmland raptor program to, um, to try to come up with some goals for barn owls, American kestrels, uh, uh, short ears, and, uh, and, and harrier, uh, who all, uh, short ear and harrier traditionally nested in Maryland uh, in farmland uh, type environments. So, um, so, the goals that we came up with is, is to, to try to gain a better understanding of, of barn owl ecology in Maryland. All those things that I talked about that we don't know much uh, about, you know, reproduction, mortality, habitat range, natal dispersal, seasonal movements. Um, we need to uh, obtain a baseline for statewide abundance. That's why the breeding bird atlas is so important because this is, this is information that we need to know where these birds are and where they're nesting. Because once we know where they're nesting in Maryland, then we can identify those critical habitats and hopefully do some work to try to preserve them. Ensure adequate and consistent monitoring. We want to establish nest box programs, okay, throughout the state and make sure that they're monitored and that all of these birds are banded if possible. We want to band as many barn owls as we can in, in, in Maryland. Obviously, broaden citizen participation through the volunteer programs and become a gateway for data. Okay, we're going to be using a um, using a program that was developed by uh, ornithologists and in, in, um, shorebird researchers in New Jersey called Nest Story, and so it'll be a repository for all the barn owl nesting throughout the throughout the state of Maryland. We use volunteers, we need volunteers to help with building nest boxes, installing nest boxes, finding these owls, okay? Finding where they nest. One of our goals that I mentioned before is to revisit those historic nesting sites, okay? That's a pretty major uh, task. That's traveling, that's finding landowners, landowner, landowner contacts, visiting those sites, seeing if the birds are still there. And obviously monitoring. Uh, the nest boxes. We have recently started doing some work with capturing adults. Now, this is where we have gained a whole lot of information. Three years of capturing adults at the nest site has given us more information than we had in 20 years of just banding chips. So we're identifying who these birds are, where, the, you know, if they're nesting in the same places year after year, and so forth. I created what's called a patio trap. This is a little trap that hangs on the front of the nest box, okay? It is triggered by a little treadle plate inside and the guillotine door 
closes behind them. On the back side of this box is screen so that the adult owls can land here. They can see and hear the chicks inside. When they walk in, the door closes behind them. If you notice this little wire that's here, there's a switch attached to the door and it illuminates a light that's attached to the side of the barn, you know, 150 feet away. So we can set this trap, sit on the far side of the field at night. And when the light comes on, you know, we've got an owl. <laughs> There's a marsh box that I was, uh, that I, you see, I've got the, I've got the uh, adult here in my hand. Just took her out of took her out of the out of the box. Mm -hmm. We collect a lot of data on them. We try to age them, determine their age, because we want to know, you know, the age of these pop of this population, the population demographics. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Solwet owl banding that is being done through Project Owlnet. You can age a bird, um, age owls by uh, shining a black light, an ultraviolet light on the wing feathers. Owls, unlike passerines, do not molt all of their flight feathers in one year. It may take them up to four or even five years to replace them all. So they'll do a few this year, a few next year, a few the following year, and so forth. New feathers, when they grow in, are coated with an enzyme um, called porphyrin. And that enzyme fluoresces under ultraviolet light. So here is a barn owl that you can see these pink feathers have lots of porphyrin on them. And those are all new feathers. Whereas the white ones have very little. That porphyrin degrades in daylight, in sunlight over time. And so the older, older feathers don't, don't fluoresce like the, like the brand new ones do. There's a study going on that I am um, working with uh, a, an organization called the Global Owl Project. It's run by a researcher named David H. Johnson, who is a you know fairly well known in in the owl world. Um, most of the world believe that there are five different species of barn owl. Okay, North America, on the other hand, does not. We think that. The barn owls that we have here in the Western Hemisphere are the same as the ones that are found in Europe and Africa and in the Far East. The Latin name for barn owl, Tito alba, which is the common barn owl right here found in Europe and Africa, is thought to be the same in, 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 in the Americas. Well, there's a, there's a petition that was set forth based on genetic data to separate these birds and call the American barn owl Taito fricata. It was rejected by the American Ornithological Union um, based on not enough data. They want some morphological data to support that as well as vocalization analysis. So we're working now on collecting this morphological data. Me, a couple other researchers, a graduate student from Walla Walla University. We have been capturing owls, measuring them, collecting all the data on them. And um, she's going to publish this as part of her uh, master's thesis um, to try to, to show that there is a difference, a statistical difference between American birds and European and Far East. So if it's all, if it finally comes to fruition, we'll have Taito fricata in the Americas. Taito glaucops is the ashy-faced owl, okay, found on Hispanola. Um, then we have Taito alba, which is in Europe and in Africa. This Taito thomensis is found on an island off the shore of Africa and nowhere else. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Then in the Far East, we have what they call the Western barn owl um, that uh, is called Taito Devonica. Okay. So that's what we're shooting for. Um, she's going to be finishing up her, her, her project this May with all the data that we have collected. We have visited numerous natural history museums and measured hundreds of museum specimens from all over North and South and Central America. Um, so she's going to analyze the data, finish with her thesis, and then hopefully we'll publish this paper 
at the end of end of uh, 2023. Moving forward, we now need to take a look at the Americas and not the rest of the world. We need to re-examine among Taito fricata what kind of subspecies we have. We know that that barn owls do not cross the Rocky Mountains. Okay. It's just too cold for them. Remember, I said they can't build up a whole lot of fat. So cold, cold temperatures um, really put a hurting on them. So is there are there multiple subspecies in North America? You know, we know that eastern birds do not share genetic material with western birds. So it's quite possible. Definitely in, the, in Central and South America as well. So this is a long-term project that we're going to be working on for, for several years to come. Global Owl Project, like I mentioned. Okay, there's a copy of the data sheet. We take about 13 different body measurements. You know, the wing length. We measure the distance between all the flight feathers, the primary and secondary feathers. Um, a lot of measurements on the legs, the halix and the, um, the tarsus and, and so forth. And then measure the wing length, the wing span, and the wing area, and determine the age of the bird as well. A couple of slides of us going through the uh, process after capturing adult bird. Um, you know, they go in this little um, restraint can. That's a, uh, a mailing tube, cardboard mailing tube, um, with a slot cut out of the uh, cut out of the tube to expose a wing. Um, the bird gets banded. We measure the wing. We do the, uh, the primary uh, uh, feather um, markings, measure the halix and the tarsus. We trace the wing on 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 uh, butcher uh, paper, freezer paper. We measure the wing span <laughs> of the bird. Um, you notice it's hooded so that it stays calm and doesn't uh, doesn't get as frightening. And then after the measurement, those measurements take about twenty minutes to gather. And then they are wing uh, photographs of the wing are made. You can see, you can even tell the age of the feathers just by the just during the daytime without the black light. Older feathers are kind of yellowish, whereas new feathers are bright white. Okay, so we can we can we're starting to gather data on how to how to de determine the age of these birds uh, based on their on their molecular photo time. And then I've got a couple of, uh, then they're released. I've got a couple of videos here. Um, hopefully they'll play and we'll see if, it, uh, see if it'll go. Is it banded? Yes. Is it the male? Um, no, I think it's female. But no. It's got, um, it's got the fishing line on its, on its foot. Oh, that's good. It's best, yeah, in the numbers, I'm going to have you do a slight toss up. Okay. okay. One, two, three, go up. Yeah. That was too fast. You so, in, in kind of in closing, um, you know, barn owls are just not a, not just a pretty face. Um, they, they, they represent some of the um, places in our landscape that are, are, are um, that are quiet um, um, and, and not visited by people, you know, secretive places that, um, that aren't intruded by humans very often. And if we, no, I'm not doing it. Well, because I'm off the screen. Well, we should be good. About there we go. So, you know, it's our, it's our responsibility to try to, um, try to ensure that these places remain. You know, um, it, it's not just a matter of, of losing a pretty bird. You know, if we lose these, these special places that, that this wildlife exists, we're losing, we're losing part of, part of our own, um, part of our own, uh, habitat as well. 
So I'd like to, um, you know, acknowledge a couple of folks um, who've helped uh, make all of this uh, possible. Um, the Global Isle Project, David H. Johnson, uh, Chris Everly, uh, Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership, who has now moved on to greener pastures. Um, the, um, Tom Humphrey of Calvert County, I mean, uh, from Frederick County, um, Dave Brinker, Scott Smith, Chris No, uh, Maryland DNR, Calvert County Natural Resources, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and the Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary and Almond Raptor Center. Um, if you're interested in, in participating as a volunteer or um, you know helping uh, with donations to help these projects uh, uh, move forward, you know you can uh, certainly contact Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership or the Global Owl Project, um, and I can I can provide this uh, this information for you, or you'll have it in the recording. So you can. Okay, thank you so much. Are there, I'm sure there are questions in the audience and online. So, uh, yeah, could you uh, uh, stop the screen sharing so we can all show ourselves faces? Yeah. There we are. That's good. Yeah, hi. Um, this this is Gail McKernan, uh, and I'm on Zoom. I've looked at the, I've seen barn owls in the Caribbean. Um, the uh, Taito Alba, or what they call it, Taito Alba in the Dominican Republic is sympatric with the uh, ashy faced owl. Right. And they're found together. And the best place to see them is at oil palm plantations where they feed yeah. on rats. Yeah. So, I don't know. Nest, you... in, nest in the palm trees, yeah, down yeah. inside. Oh, yeah, with this kind of incident. Yeah, well, no, uh, I mean, we went out at night and we had about 25 barn owls, if you can believe it, and, uh, and about six of the other ones. Um, also, in the uh, on Dominica is a distinct uh, Taito owl, owl. I don't know if you looked at that one. It's, it's probably currently listed as a subspecies of Taito alba. So yeah. Bird, the birds that are here in, in North America are Taito alba pratincola, and that one is probably a, a, a separate subspecies. Even yeah, it's though very it's different Taito looking. Alba, it's very different looking, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I know in Cuba, the uh, Cuban ornithologists feel that their barn owl is a separate species as well. Yes. Yeah. That, that does. does yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have a lot of work ahead of us, don't we? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and as, just as a quick aside, uh, the um, uh, one of the Cuban ornithologists actually stayed with us 20 years ago when he was visiting the Smithsonian and he brought with him the skeleton of the three foot tall or meter tall fossil flightless barn owl. Oh. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wrote in if she wanted looking at DNA. DNA. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the question is, are, are they looking at DNA? That, that petition that was first submitted to the American Ornithological Union was based solely on DNA, okay? So there is evidence on the, in, in the DNA that, that our birds in, in the Americas is different from European birds, okay? Um, they just, they, they want more data. The species, um, to, to determine a new species, it's, it's kind of a, a protocol has been set that DNA is not necessarily all that you need. You need more information. DNA, the morphology, and the vocalization, all those three combined. And that, that work has been done with other owl species in around the world to, to delineate new new species. So that's that's why they're that's why it was re rejected. So that's why we're collecting all this morphological data on them. Yes. I noticed in a couple of the I noticed in a couple of the slides that you took the gloves off and you were <laughs> you were holding and none of them was holding with no glove protection. Correct. Yes. But they have pretty pointy sharp hands. So what was the gamble there? Well, <clears throat> the the those gloves are very thick. Okay, and um, I really only use the glove. Um, if I'm reaching into a box where the bird can 
foot move. Okay, um, because if I reach in barehanded, you know that's that's not going to be pleasant <laughs> for me. It might be a okay for her, but not for me. Um, so what I usually do is let her foot the glove. Okay, I only put it on one hand. Let her put the glove and then slip in with my bare hand to get to get a good grip on her. Um, so you know, handling handling the birds with the gloves on is 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 too difficult. You know, I can't feel how tight I'm squeezing. You know, I need to be able to to know, you know, to, to manipulate. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's it's the way you the way you handle it. The more you handle the you know the more comfortable you get, and the more comfortable you get, the more likely you are to get footed. Okay, <laughs> so I've been you know I've been I've been nailed uh, plenty of times uh, from from the careless. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's there's important ways to handle these birds to to try to lessen the stress on them okay um we handle them as quickly as we possibly can you know so that you know it's not a drawn out time we, we're always quiet when we're when we're with them so that we're not you know lessening the stress level um so we're doing this we're keeping them uh, quiet and dark well we we keep them in in boxes holding boxes where it's you know it's completely dark and they stay pretty calm um you know so some of your pictures show them hunting during the day, twenty four seven. No, no. They, thank you for pointing that out. Um, these these guys are strictly nocturnal. Okay. Okay. The slides that you have that you've seen of, of daytime flight and so forth, those are probably in in, in Britain. It, it's legal to keep a barn owl as a pet. Yeah. So <laughs> there are a lot of falconers who who fly fly barn owls. Okay. And um, so that's those are those are most of those photos um, from you know from. So if I was going to go out looking for these as an amateur birder, I'm not. I mean, you said they're elusive. Yeah. Yeah. But Did you know, you uh, my husband is British, and he says that in the late afternoon, quite often, because he was a ringer in Britain, the barn owls out there will fly hunting in the late afternoon. I've seen them myself when I visited his family. Yeah, that's that. <clears> that, that walk that's, on. That, that that's uncommon in North America. That's yeah, uncommon. I know. Yeah, you'd never see it here. Just, uh, but not that rare in Britain. Anyone, if you walk in a deserted barn somewhere. Sometimes uh, that very first slide that I had of that yeah. bird way up in there roosting, and that, that's that's how you find it. Yes. I want to follow up with that. If <laughs> if it's daylight, you know, in the summertime in the northern latitude, you get 20, 23 hours of daylight. If you got barn owls they, and they're nocturnal, like hmm. they only have like an hour to go shopping. So like <laughs> how do they maintain their balance for nutrition? So I don't know if you remember looking at the slide of the distribution, the global distribution. You can see there was a line across North America, okay? Um, even in the northern states like Minnesota and the Dakotas and so forth, they're they're not very common. Okay, so to go even further than that, they're absent. Okay. And then the snowy owl or other owls will take over that space. Yes, that's correct. Shorter. Shorter. Yeah. We've seen them at high noon in Costa Rica sitting on a fence How about that? Isn't that something? <laughs> nice meadow. Yeah. <laughs> well, if that were to happen here in North America, that means. There's probably something wrong with that bird who's starving for that to come out. They are they're they're hammered pretty hard by red-tailed hawks. So you know to be out during the daytime, they're gonna they're they're they're, they're taking very, very heavy risk uh, of being preyed upon. So you mentioned um anything about pesticides. As one of the mortality factors. And thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, that's another thing that we don't know much about in North American birds. Um, in uh, in Canada, there's probably they have they they found you know a, a dead barn owls. Ninety ninety percent um, have uh, high levels of rodenticide. Um, the um, and, and el elsewhere in Europe as well. Um, so we 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 just don't know. Um, that's something that that needs to be needs to be investigated. 
something you didn't mention that I find interesting is we saw a barn owl dead in the middle of the road and within maybe a hundred feet the other barn owl was there like morning. Oh, yeah, was it still alive? The so one in the road was dead. Dead, but the, but the second one was alive? Yeah, it was in wow. a climate place. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. That probably happens with a lot of birds. Yeah. What month did the uh, babies start? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, so here in Maryland, we probably have uh, the, the majority nest in the spring. Okay, so... Um, I know that uh, I know that on the eastern shore they're, they're already starting to lay eggs now. Okay, there's been uh, several nests over on the over in Delmarva. That, that, so that's a little early. Normally, eggs usually start to appear the beginning of beginning of April. Okay, uh, at the end of March, beginning of April. Okay, so you know, 30 days, 35 days um, uh, incubation, and then nine weeks in the nest before they fled. So, yeah. so it's most of the summer. They are known to nest year round. So they will, if food sources are, are good, they'll continue. They'll, the, once that one clutch, uh, brood pledges, they'll start up again, you know, right. like a bluebird does. Okay. Um, and they'll nest even in the winter, winter months. Um, obviously in the, in the warmer regions. Um, but, um, you know, it's all, it's all about the food. If, if they're getting plenty of food, then, then they're going to be then they're going to be, be reproductively active. So, any other questions on Zoom? Well, if anybody's interested in in helping with some of these these born out projects, please uh, please contact me, um, and uh, we can I can give you my my uh, contact information. I don't know if you want to put it in the chat or not. Or, we could share it later, um, but uh, yeah, we can we can definitely uh, use a hand. So, Barnhouse could use a hand. Thank you so much.